Okay, Christine, you, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much and good afternoon. Um, I'm Christine Paddock and I direct C4's research on forests and livelihoods. And um, I, together with you, heard six really ex exciting presentations from each of our six panelists. Um, I do need to say that John Holdren needed to leave us uh, because of um, urgent business, I assume, uh, more urgent than sitting on our panel. But um, we have heard, I think, all six of these talks, I think you all found very informative, very exciting, each from a different viewpoint, each based on distinct experiences, um, using different tools, different approaches. And I think that um, that would be enough. I think that was very enriching to all of us. And if we were to end there, it would be enough for all of us. But as many of our speakers have actually pointed out, um, we can't afford, in trying to really um, affect policy on something as complex as sustainable development, as, uh, the, the, as, as improving livelihoods, as, as uh, contributing to the health of landscapes that include forests, we can't afford to be just a single voice. We can't afford to use one viewpoint. We can't afford to, to base our work on just one set of experiences. And actually, many of our speakers here are those who have, been, who have already done that, who have learned to integrate many experiences, have learned to integrate many people in their science and in, their, in the policy relevant science that they do and in the recommendations that they can make. So let's just continue this a little bit now um, and you know, join in a conversation and not only a conversation between among our panelists but also a conversation with you. So um, I expect that pretty soon we'll get the questions that, that we're going to, um, going to pose to our panel and that we're going to um, discuss among ourselves as a panel. But first, I'd like to give each one of our panelists a very short time, maybe two to three minutes, to give us a little bit of their reflections on what their, other, what their colleagues have said and what has actually come out from the integration of the various things that we heard. So um, I guess maybe uh, beginning with Carlos, um, since you've been sitting here and hearing most of them for, for the longest, please, um, we would appreciate. But very brief, uh, two to three minutes, because uh, we're, we are running a bit um, over time. <clears throat> yes, uh, thanks a lot. Yes, it was illuminating to hear different perspectives. Uh, let me just say, uh, I, I've known uh, some of the people here, Dan, and uh, Eduardo for, for many years, decades actually, to, to tell you uh, the truth. And uh, it, it's interesting because I guess uh, if I put together their, their two talks, it shows really the, the dilemmas that we are facing in Brazil. Uh, on one hand, uh, yes, innovation is uh, central. In fact, the, the, the minister I worked in 2011 put the I, it's now Minister of Science, Technology, Innovation. Innovation is recognized to be a very important element of this, the development strategy. And uh, I, I could not disagree with one thing that Dan mentioned about uh, the ways of uh, constructing, constructing a sustainable future for the Amazon. Yes, those uh, good success stories can be translated to other tropical countries. Intensification, yes, Cheryl, this is the way to go about uh, tropical agriculture. On the other hand, uh, if you listen to Eduardo, then you saw that there are a lot of mismatches. Uh, this only innovation-driven development and uh, intensification agricultural productivity, more profits to farmers, does not lead automatically to reducing poverty and inequality. And this is a major challenge for developing countries. It's a major challenge for Brazil. Inequality was re being reduced slowly and slowly, but too slow. So it, it, the equation is not a simple one. And I guess Eduardo very well uh, put 
uh, that question that, you know, even the, 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 the well-known success story of the acai palm fruit, uh, which is bringing two, three billion dollars into the Amazon economy, not necessarily is uh, causing a tremendous change in equality and uh, income. And that has all to do with human capital. And that's why I said in, in my, third, uh, my third point, it's the education revolution. If we fail tropical countries, and even within tropical countries, poorer regions of tropical countries, if we fail in the education revolution, I'm pretty sure we are not going to reach uh, development in, in, in the Amazon and other tropical countries. So though I will stop my comments saying I, I really liked all those elements, but putting them together, uh, we need to reduce inequality and poverty. And this is perhaps much more difficult than we might anticipate. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps another comment from, from our next uh, panelist? Okay. Again, so, very brief. <laughs> Sorry yeah, so, such an enforcer. So, I um, also enjoyed the talks a lot, and, and I must say I was encouraged by the amount of discussion around agriculture and not from such a negative perspective. So we are moving forward. I think this discussion would have been very different 10 years ago. So there is progress and we need to bring more and more people into these discussions. And I think it does have to be not so much at the global level, although we need to recognize that, but it's really these local regional conversations and policies and governance issues that I think will really move us forward in the right direction. Push yep, uh, three things basically. I mean, I liked all the presentation that was very uh, rich. Uh, one thing which clearly emerges and that also gives me a strength to see that we really need integration of conservation, whether it is change in the forest stock or biomass or emission of uh, the greenhouse gases. We need to uh, uh, bring them, this biophysical, biogeophysical changes into our social and, and economic planning. So that is one, so integration is needed. Secondly, uh, from my own presentation, what I said, I wanted to reiterate that there are some estimates and economic values, but and there has been serious effort in last 20 years or so, starting from uh, you know, Stern report or the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity. But economic estimate must be socially, you know, credible. If they are not socially, you know, credible, they become another video games and nobody is going to pay attention to. Third, we talked about changing the basic compass of, of the progress, that is the GDP or national income. It is not going to happen in one day uh, because it is nicely institutionalized and the first step should be that we have to improve them, but in the long run, we have to think about a really better indicator which has a strong scientific basis. At the same time, they are easy and easy to comprehend by the policymakers. So I will stop here and we'll wait for some more questions before I go into further discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are many entry points here that I'd like to talk about. Well, I'll pick on, on Dan's uh, push for what we call a, a polycentric approach. I mean, several initiatives that uh, in themselves would sort of emer uh, help to emerge uh, larger uh, solutions. Uh, there are limits to that too, and I, I think that's the balance that we need to, to look for, you know, what are the structural and large-scale adjustments that are needed to facilitate the integration of these uh, local-scale solutions. And I'll use my example of the poverty of municipalities as one example where uh, important structural adjustments done at the national level could go a long way. So there are no incentives nowadays for the transformation of resources at the local level, in which that uh, the fiscal and the tax results of that would revert into, industry, into urban infrastructure. And I'll bring with that the piece that I see indirectly or directly was, was discussed here, which is employment. Um, 
one of the biggest transformations that we see in rural areas, you go in the Amazon, you go in Japan, you go in Sweden, you go here, is a, very, a significant intergenerational change in the way the use engages with agriculture and engages with, with economic activities. Um, and the lack of opportunities, the lack of creative industries that offered uh, a perspective to the use to stay in rural areas, to engage with production systems and not leave for, uh, for cities is one of the key problems that we have to deal with. And that has a lot with, to do with, I think, with reforms that are needed to, pro to promote value aggregation in forest areas around the world where employment and other things would come forward and will offer a different perspective to the youth population that now sees very little future into that. Yeah, I love the acai story. Uh, if you fly, fly into Beleng, the islands around Beleng are all forested, and they've been managed for acai for, for decades. And I've always wondered, you know, how could, how could Brazil have been jumped out in front of acai, done the marketing, done, been the entrepreneurial a agent, so more of that value could have come to Brazilian companies and Brazilian producers. I think the, uh, I think, there's a really fantastic examples of policies that are getting it wrong today that could be easily changed. And since so many of us are talking about Brazil, I'll just cite a few examples. For example, the, there's a, a ceiling on the price of gasoline in Brazil that has basically knocked the wind out of the sugarcane ethanol uh, business. And so it's a, a retracting industry that should be expanding ethanol production. It's one of the most efficient types of biofuel. Yes, I said the uh, controversial word biofuel. It's a, one of the most efficient ways to get fuel off the land, and Brazil's fleet is almost all flex fuel or moving toward in that direction. But this policy for containing inflation, basically, uh, has gutted that industry. Another is, and this gets to your point on, on for counties, most counties, their budgets come from an allocation of the ICMS tax. And that tax is there on circulating merchandise, and it has killed the soy crushing industry in Brazil. So that has migrated to Argentina, so raw beans go from Brazil to China. The downside of that is that Brazil has not vertically integrated uh, to do more poultry and, and pork. And, and so it's sort of these missed opportunities, huge miss, missed opportunities, that with a little bit of, of policy um, tweaking, we could fix. And Carlos, uh, I share your dream of really exploiting commercially uh, and sustainably the, the biodiversity. And, and Pushpam, I think the challenge with GDP is, is enormous. I I'm, I'm still don't know the answer, but it seems like it needs to be sort of a Manhattan, maybe the wrong uh, example to use here. But. <laughs> a massive inf influx of, of uh, incentives and ingenuity and entrepreneurship. And, but we've been talking about it for decades, and it hasn't happened. Yeah. Great. Thank you very, very much. Actually, quite a number of our questions that we got were related to these ideas of, of um, how to increase the value, the value aggregation in these areas. And, uh, but specific, and I think that perhaps we've already dealt with these since we need to deal with with all the questions quite quickly. Um, one specific addition to that might be to talk about actually local rights and indigenous rights in the, in the context of value aggregation and international trade. Um, I don't know, perhaps Eduardo would like to speak a little more uh, about that, a little briefly again, about that. Um. Well, I would start to, I mean, to highlight the diversity of, of indigenous situations that you find throughout the world and how that relationship needs to pay attention to the context. And, and to that, I'll, I'll say that you know, there is not a single solution to that because the relationship between local communities, indigenous communities, and different kinds of markets is very context specific. So it would be a mistake, I think, to think about magical bullets that you know, cut across that. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, the other thing is that there has been uh, too little attention, I think, to, um, to investments and intensif intensification of local production systems and to, to, to limit the bottlenecks in which those production systems work. 
And a lot of the problems in, in economic return that local communities have, have to do with very basic infrastructure in which the cost of transportation and other things eats the, the labor of uh, the, their, uh, the, the sweat of their labors. So, I mean, the, the two points is the context is specific, nature of that. The other one is that, you know, a lot of, of the issues have to do with basic infrastructural needs that allow them to reap the benefits uh, at different scales. So. And the question goes on to ask, and how does that actually, um, how does that affect the idea that has been quite powerful of local people or indigenous people being stewards of the forest? If we, what we're promoting is more communication, more international trade, and would you, anyone care to uh, comment on that? I, I don't think it's it's not it's compatible. I mean, I don't I don't think why we should not think of uh, you know as those indigenous populations which wish to join in uh, because some populations they prefer to be isolated and we should respect, of course, that. But most, at least in, in Brazil and Amazonia, they want to join in. And I don't see any, any barrier for them to be integrated through information highways, through trade, uh, into producing goods that they feel uh, opportunities to produce. They will be their goods, their uh, services, uh, not necessarily uh, different than what they've been doing, but with value added, at least in my context, I'm not an anthropologist, I don't deal directly in my work with indigenous population, but in my context I see tremendous willingness for them to join in this new uh, world, uh, but keeping their culture. They are very strong in keeping their culture. And a very important element, and all, all of us uh, know, of their culture is the forest. So I think you can put those two things together. I don't see they are not, uh, they are compatible. They are not, it's, it's a myth to think they are incompatible, in my opinion. Thank you. We also have a number of questions that um, address the green economy and also what kind of research may be needed in order to uh, inform this process of moving towards a green economy. Um, and. Um, and what actually might, might motivate, might move governments to, act, to move in that direction. I, it's, I think, largely a, a question for you, Pushpa. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have been able to identify the research gaps and needs uh, in order to use the tools and approaches of green economy. But uh, as a researcher myself, I would like to highlight two, three major research gaps. When we talk about valuation, economic valuations, or accounting, valuations are used for various purposes. One is a typical cost-benefit. Sometimes people use it to design a payment between the beneficiary and the you know, providers, what is known as the payment for ecosystem services. And many of the even Red Plus schemes are based on the spirit and the theory of PES. Oh, there are many other tools like biodiversity offset or wetland banking. You need valuations. So they come from microeconomic theory. While the question at the national or global level are purely macroeconomic in nature. Like, uh, and as one can see, those of you who are from economic science, that valuations done on an experimental plot or site-specific values is probably no good for the macro questions, which is, for example, national income accounting, or asset pricing in the economy, or you know, aggregation of natural capital with the mainstream accounts, existing accounts, at the national or the regional level. So valuation in macro setting is probably the first research agenda I want to think of. Uh, somehow, we have done a lot, we in the sense not only the UNEP, but all UN agencies and the research institutions on, on valuation in microeconomic setting. But the macroeconomic setting, even in the university research departments, the research is very, very basic. And that is, there are few good macroeconomists, but they know macro variable, they know macro, they don't know natural capital well. And there are some good, you know, ecologists, they, do, they know ecosystem or nature, 
but their understanding of macroeconomics, a structural model is probably very, very basic. So that is one area. Second uh, is something which, uh, how to make the valuation a social process. And whenever we talk about economic value, it looks like, you know, you use, you know, market-based or constructed market-based or, you know, those kind of methods. But sometimes it has been found that they become a statistical jugglery and to go to the policy makers, politicians, the prime ministers, the ministers with those numbers who know public pulse probably better than anybody else, they find it reluctant to accept them. The reason is not that the valuation is wrong, but we lack confidence, we lack you know, clarity. I'm talking about the economist. How to make our valuation clear and how we should be confident where you have a 10 minutes time with the president and if you say that oh this happened then that happened then this happens there are interlinked there are so you know this system that system they are very good discourse do it in the classroom but to make it to take it to the policy makers who have the discretion and clout to influence the public at large you have to be very clear and there are not many good valuation experts who are clear in their message. A lot of research has to go into that. There are many more, but I will stop here. Thank you very much. I think Dan wanted to add something yeah, just there, too. Add on that. I think it's such a fascinating question of, and I think we have to be extremely pragmatic to make these transitions to, towards green. And, uh, and I think that we ta need to take it down to the, the ground. Mo I agree with you that there's a huge issue with how you measure ecosystem services and the valuation piece. But there are some things that everyone can agree on, and quite quickly. And as you said, socialize it. And we need to grab those opportunities. I think four is, is particularly amenable to that sort of convergence and consensus. And let's just figure that out for four. We can, we can measure it. And if we can measure it in a way that it's going to reduce risk for investment. Maybe that's as good as we can do right now to really take ecosystem services to scale. Uh, Eduardo, you? We yeah. just want to make up. I'm not an economist, so I use the voice of a, a friend of, of, of many of ours here, Chiquito Costa, said that the missing link is the mesoeconomics. Uh, you know, that has very little value in the academic sets between the micro and the meso, but that's where the regional economic has to play a role and has to be value, I think, to understand the interconnections between these global chains and local process. Uh, maybe one more thing, just a quick point. Uh, one thing, uh, upscaling scaling the values from the micro to the macro, there are a large number of caveats. How to make those caveats and assumptions plausible and practical. Again, I repeat, in upscaling the values from the local to the regional or the national scale, what are the assumptions and how to make those assumptions more practical and defensible? That is another research thing which we, you know, we should be thinking of. Actually, uh, Dan, uh, there's another question that's sort of along those lines but does talk about your reference to commodification of tropical um, landscapes as, as a vehicle for poverty alleviation um, and ask the question whether this really, whether, um, this really is desirable, um, but also whether this is actually conducive to, to increased food production. And I would like to add a little bit to that, a, a bit based on what Lou said as his last comment. Um, and, you know, referring to the, to the real enthusiasm that people had, especially hearing yesterday that so many companies had uh, pledged to, as you said, to take deforestation out of their value chains. But um, uh, several months ago, the, the um, I believe it was the vice, uh, the assistant director for sustainability of Unilever said that they indeed, they're one of the early pledgers, right? And, they, and a, a real pioneer, but said that in order to do that and in order to, to guarantee traceability of that, of that value chain and to the guarantee that there was no deforestation, they would actually have to sort of slough off 80% of their smallholder producers because it's just too difficult, just impossible to do. So um, again, would you care to comment, and I can see that more than one person wants to comment <laughs> on that, and exactly what, the, what, what is the future for, the, for smallholders under these, um, 
uh, under this new, this, this new uh, regime of no deforestation? Yeah, that's a great question. I think smallholders are the vulnerable uh, element of society as, you know, and I, I, first of all, I think it's inevitable. I think the expansion of commodities into the tropics, it's going to happen, and we have to deal with that. Uh, it's not every country. It doesn't dominate most tropical landscapes. Most tropical landscapes are, have a, a much greater diversity, other types of crops. Um, and, and, but I think we're seeing a lot of movement on this because this is where you get the leverage. If, when a few big companies can influence supply chains uh, on palm, on soy, on beef, uh, that's where you get action, and that's been where a lot of the focus has been. With smallholders, I think they tend to, they, they run the risk because it's so expensive to do farm by farm auditing to see if they're deforesting or not. The Dayak farmers of Kalimantan would love to have a, a patch of palm, but they do not want to abandon their Swedens. And so when a big company like, like a Wilmar announces a zero deforestation, that it's not far enough into the future to allow the systems to adjust or something less than perfect, but probably very good, which is a, a reduced deforestation target. Uh, and not to take anything away from Wilmar's very sort of courageous uh, announcement, but there is the risk that there, there's a, going to be increased po poverty and exclusion of, of communities through, through this sort of initiative. And I think I, we come back to, you have to increase the scale. Look at the entire landscape, as Peter was talking about, look at the entire district, the entire province, that's where we should be measuring success and make sure that smallholders are not, not being excluded. Yeah, I just wanted to also reiterate the issue of smallholder farmers. I think it's similar to the whole issue about indigenous peoples of the Amazon or smallholder farmers. And I refer to Africa where average farm size is less than five hectares. And so it's a very different situation from the Amazon. But it is a similar situation. How do you aggregate those farmers? How do you link them into any market system? And I think that's going to be the key as you see people are still looking at Africa. There have been very few large investments. I think Unilever has been one of the first. But how is that going to happen? Or is there a way to leapfrog? Are there lessons? And I think some of these South-South lessons could be very, very important. How to aggregate. It's a smallholder. It's the whole poverty livelihoods at the forest agriculture transition. Yeah. Um, well, the topic is very dear to me, I think. In part, that's one of the topics that you get stuck in a polarizer discussion very often. Um, small farmers, I think, they have, they have a, a double exposure kind of scenario, a double pressure kind of scenario, uh, which is very general. One is internal. I mean, the, the lack of, the long lack of infrastructure, service, recognition has created a situation where you have very little expectations among young uh, farmers you know, to continue on that route. And on the, the other hand, you have uh, uh, you know, openly in Brazil and elsewhere a criminalization of small farmer activities, in, in such as Sweden cultivation and others, in ways that are, are very unfair and very simplistic. So you have those, those sort of the, the dilemma in which they, they live. Now, on the other hand, it's, I think it's very difficult to imagine a future, in a urban future, without a very uh, active small farming economy, being localized or not. But if we do not think about the small farming in the context of the employment need and in the, the context in which you can absorb an enormous amount of contingency that is now moving to the city, uh, you know, it's not a problem that will be solved with intensification of other things. So. Um, I'm afraid that I've been, I've been given a symbol that um, we need to end our discussion. Um, and it's not just because Eduardo is, was, is an anthropologist and I'm an anthropologist that I'm giving him the last word, um, but it, we're, under, we're un, under a considerable amount of pressure. In any case, I'd like to thank every one of you, and I'd like to thank all of you who contributed, and I'd also...
And I'd also like to apologize to those of you who didn't get your questions in. We have many more questions. I'll be happy to both distribute them to the panelists and also please feel free to grab these panelists as they come off the stage and ask the, the questions. And there are a number of very, very interesting questions here. So again, thank you very much. Or through email, yes, we'll make. And now I think we can all stay here and, and we'll have the the closing of the of the of our yeah. um